May 9, 2012. A Sukhoi Superjet 100 with 45 people on board is flying over the Indonesian province of West Java as part of a Welcome Asia demonstration tour. The 30-minute flight is intended as a demonstration of the new jet to VIPs and potential customers. Under thick cloud cover in mountainous terrain, the Sukhoi Superjet 100 disappears from air traffic controller radar. For the next few minutes, the controller on duty attempts to contact the flight multiple times with no response. It isn't until the next day that search teams discover the plane's wreckage spread down a cliffside at Mount Salak at an altitude of about 6,200 feet. What could have caused this flight meant to bolster support and sales for the Russian aircraft manufacturer to end in tragic loss of all 45 people on board? Find out on this episode of Black Box Down. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Black Box Down. It's Gus and Chris. Hello, Chris. Hello, Gus. We're here with another episode. Uh, as always, before we get into it, I want to remind you to give us a follow on social media at Black Box Down Pod, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, always post images and uh, supplemental content that uh, you you may find useful when you're uh, when you're uh, listening to this podcast. Yeah, uh, and and, uh, and it's also where we have we'll post stuff like uh, like um, I don't know bonus things like like uh, animations of of stuff from the uh, show or oh or yeah like explainers where we talk about you know I don't know, weird random things about airplanes. And you can see all of that in our link tree, which uh, Chris so lovingly cultivates. <laughs> and all it's in all of our uh, it's fertilized handles. daily trees <laughs> blossoming. Hmm. Okay, not that what I had in mind, but okay. <laughs> oh wait, no. Well, yeah. Yeah. No, no, I got you. Um, okay, so this uh, another unusual flight. You know, uh, a couple episodes ago we talked about the acceptance flight when one airline was transferring a plane that they had leased back over to the. The mm-hmm. owner airline. Yeah. This was not an acceptance flight or anything, but this was like a demonstration flight. So this one's a little a little different than we're normally used to talking about. This wasn't like a regularly scheduled point A to point B flight. This was like a promotional flight. This was a new plane uh, that was being rolled out and the manufacturer kind of sent it on a, a tour around the world to potential customers and, you know, let potential customers ride on it for a little bit and, you know, just kind of check it out, see what it's like. Uh-huh. So this Particular flight, like I said, was only supposed to be about 30 minutes. It took off from Jakarta. It was going to like head down to the south, circle around for a little bit, and then land back uh, at Jakarta where it took off from. But uh, like I said, it that didn't happen. Yeah. So this flight, the flight number is also a little weird because it wasn't a regularly scheduled passenger flight. It was referred to as either Sukhoi 36801 or RA 36801. I'm going to try to avoid saying that whenever possible <laughs> just because it's a lot of numbers and it's a, it's a, it's a mouthful. This was, like I said, this was a new plane, so this was the first fatal accident involving a Sukhoi Superjet 100. These planes, they're not, I guess they were, they, they're intended to be regional jets, not like, you know, smaller than a 737, more like a, a, an Embraer or a CRJ. You know, maybe they would hold maybe 100 people at most, maybe probably less than that. So not a big, not like what you would consider like a regular size plane, but a slightly smaller intended for regional airlines. So, yeah, or, or private customers because sure sure why not i'm just wondering because they were like showing it off like potential cut like i don't know that seems more like a private thing but i guess also airline executives and pilots mm-hmm. you know okay yeah uh in fact actually there was i'm gonna i was gonna get to that here in a bit but there was so uh, besides the crew in the cockpit there was also a third person in the cockpit who was a pilot for an indonesian airline who was just kind of riding along to check out the plane mm. i had to look up where indonesia was i'm embarrassed to say <laughs> it's like in between australia and india kind of uh yeah it's like southeast asia um it's uh there's a lot of islands that compromise yeah. indonesia and we've talked about it a few times it's the most i believe it's considered the most mountainous country in the world it's, it's all I mean, it's all islands the islands are just mountains right yeah you see the tops that are sticking out of the ocean this was this flight like i said they've been doing this for a while going around the world, going around uh, specifically East and Southeast Asia, showing off the plane. So this was actually the second of two scheduled demonstration flights under the command of test pilot and former cosmonaut Alexander Yablantsev and first officer Alexander Kochetkov. The passengers on board, like I said, uh, were prospective clients. Uh, There were some journalists as well who were covering the event and some Sukhoi personnel observing the capabilities of the aircraft. Sukhoi was the manufacturer. Uh Um, So, and the accident aircraft was actually a replacement that was sent in after the first successfully completed demonstration flight was found to have a technical glitch, oh. uh, which they had later identified. They said it was a, a leak in the nozzle in the engine. I don't know what they meant by that. All you have to know is first plane had a, had a slight 
uh, issue, so they uh-huh. sent in this one to, to fly in its place for the demonstration. I wonder. <laughs> what, new plane, right? You always yeah. got to wonder. And is it? The, and like I said, this plane, the Superjet 100, was actually the first production airliner model produced in Russia since the di- uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union oh. in 1991. And it was by the, um, the, the JSC Sukhoi company, like I said. It was manufactured in 2009, and the aircraft had uh, accumulated over 800 flight hours at the time of the accident. So, Wait, so it took them... Wait, since 19... That's a long time to go without making a plane. Well, like uh, a new plane, I should say. You uh-huh. know, it takes a long time to design and come up with a new okay. plane. Uh, so like it's not from like, design to like... To from, production. From, yeah, okay. That makes more sense. I was about yeah, to from say the, like... From the time someone was like, hmm, let's make a new plane <laughs> to the time <laughs> that it actually comes out, right? Because there's a lot of engineering and design that yeah. goes into it and oh. figuring out how everything's going to work. That makes this like crappier. In, in the way I feel bad, I feel bad for whoever designed it, at least right now. I'm like, they, were probably, they were probably like, we got to show them that, you know, Russians know how to make good planes and then we're going to show it around. Ugh. Yeah, and then you try to get people to buy it. So you've probably never heard of Sukhoi. Like, it's a Russian plane manufacturer. Like, you were used yeah. to talking about, like, the big ones here are like Boeing and Airbus. Sometimes we talk about uh, Embraer. So Sukhoi... They have a, a long history as a military aircraft manufacturer in the Soviet Union and Russia. So lots of Soviet and Russian fighter jets are manufactured by Sukhoi. They're not like the exclusive manufacturer of military jets, but they do produce a lot of military fighter jets. And they were kind of trying to break into uh, the civilian aircraft market as well. Okay. It's strange to think about, but the same thing happens here. Boeing also makes uh, uh, military planes. Like we think about like McDonnell Douglas and the, the planes that make uh, military aircraft in the United States. Sometimes it's also the same manufacturers. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense, especially with the Soviet Union. Yeah. Or Russia. Well, yeah, okay. we're, we're kind of talking about a time that, <laughs> yeah. that straddles both, right? For example, just to give like the Boeing equivalent, like, you know, Boeing makes and has made over, you know, history uh, a lot of bombers like the the b-52 i'm sure you're familiar you've heard of a b-52 uh-huh the b stands for boeing oh <laughs> uh so uh yeah boeing you know made uh has made a, a lot of bombers and other aircraft as well so I, I i just say that because it sounds weird to think like oh this military aircraft manufacturer is trying to make passenger planes like the same thing happens here it's <laughs> it's yeah. not it's not that really unusual they the manufacturer sukhoi they had hoped that this goodwill tour would help increase production of the Superjet. And at the time of the accident, they had orders for 170 of the planes worldwide. And they were hoping that this tour would uh, spark interest and that they would be able to take even more orders and produce more of the planes. So this flight departed from Halim Perdana Kasuma International Airport in a south heading, I'll say that, and climbed to okay. 10,000 feet as instructed by air traffic control. From a technical perspective, there's navigational aids, uh, and there's a navigational aid at this airport, and they were cleared to go on a uh, radial of 200 degrees off of that, which is pretty much just like pretty much south, but a little west, kind of like south southwest. Uh-huh. The agreed flight plan was to fly to what they called the Boger area, and did not contain any information about the area. And this area is like just a little south of uh, Jakarta. Given that the previous demonstration flight reached the point on this 200 radial at 20 miles uh, away, it's likely believed the pilot believed the second demonstration flight was approved to the same point. So they'd already done one flight. They knew they'd gone about 20 miles out from uh, the airport uh, to the south, and they were just going to kind of do it again at 10,000 feet. Yeah, and it's the same airport and everything? Yeah. Air, exact. Okay, yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm... I'm this area, how can I say this without giving too much away? The, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, I, I'll, I'll say this. I, I mentioned at the very beginning that um, the, the plane collided. They, they found the wreckage on a cliffside. That yeah. it, that's where it collided. This cliffside was on the side of a mountain called Mount Salak. And the Jakarta Post has dubbed Mount Salak an airplane graveyard. Oh, no. Yeah, it's not great. There's high turbulence and fast-changing weather conditions uh, around this mountainous terrain, and they've been cited as contributing factors to multiple aviation crashes. In the decade before this particular accident, there'd been seven uh, aviation crashes on record in the area. So, like I said, like, like I said earlier, Indonesia, very mountainous. In particular, this mountain uh, <laughs> has, a, has a real bad uh, reputation. Uh, yeah. all, all that being said... The Sukhoi Superjet, you know, was 
a new plane. It was modern and it was equipped with a terrain awareness warning system, uh, TAWS, which was aimed to prevent, you know, controlled flight into terrain accidents by providing the flight crew with basic ground proximity warning system alerts and collision prediction alerts. Uh, and we've talked about these before, just like it's that automated voice that goes off in the cockpit that warns them when they're about to hit ground or hit the yeah. hit some hit something. And they can go ahead. Like it's not just hitting ground from below. It's like, right? Um, there's different versions. That is a good question. So there are different versions depending on talk- whether or not you're talking about ground proximity warning systems or enhanced ground proximity warning systems. Uh, more modern ones do predictive. Like the older style would just tell you immediately what was you know under and directly in front. More modern ones do look ahead a little bit and do give you that information. And this aircraft did have a more modern version. Like I said, this was a yeah. pretty new aircraft. So uh, all that being said... When the cockpit voice recorder was pulled for this plane and listened to, they did hear a single terrain ahead pull up audio alert. And then later they heard several avoid terrain messages uh, oh. on, the, on the recorder. Yet the flight still managed to end up on the side of a mountain. And this mountain was actually so steep that rescue crews could not reach the site. Oh, whoa. So this... This is like a cliff face type. Yeah, it was like an 80 degree cliff face. So it's pretty much like straight up and down. Yeah. The teams who went to try to recover the black boxes had to rappel down from the top of a cliff. Oh my God. Because essentially the plane hit the side of a mountain, hit a cliff side, and then the wreckage just, you know, rolled down yeah. to the base. That's really scary. Yeah. So Mount Salak is a 7,254 foot high mountain. And remember, they were cleared to fly at 10,000 feet. So shouldn't have been an issue. Uh-huh. However, while they were doing their demonstration flight, the pilot asked permission to descend and to perform what they called an orbit to the right, basically a right-hand turn. So they requested a descent to 6,000 feet Uh uh, and to do a a right turn. Uh, The air traffic control approved it, and then that's when the aircraft disappeared from the radar. Why would they they descend to turn? Because they were getting ready. This was, remember, there was only a 30-minute flight, so they didn't Uh get up very high. They were only at 10,000 feet to begin with. They wanted to do one last turn in order to try to uh, get rid of some altitude so they could get ready to land back at the airport. Okay. So the turn was part of like, yeah. It wasn't part of like a flight plan or anything, uh, but they, were, they wanted to, you know, show off the plane a little more. And, um, and while they were doing that, they figured we may as well start descending since we have to mm-hmm. descend to get back to the airport anyway. Air traffic control approved it, and we know uh, the outcome here. Yeah. But they had warnings. That's crazy. Right. And there were warnings. So this was, it's not like the mountain appeared out of nowhere. Yeah. And they're, uh, they were and talking to air traffic a, control. It was, it was <laughs> the airplane graveyard. Do you think if, if you would know its reputation might precede it? You know? Yeah. Right. 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 Uh, so a lot of things, a lot of questions to be asked yeah. here. So there's a, you know, as always, we have to deal with uh, time zone differences here. So okay. the flight departed at 2 a.m. UTC which is 9 a.m. Indonesian time. Uh, Indonesian time is seven hours ahead of uh, universal time. Uh, The flight plans for the first and second demonstration flight were filed at the airport briefing office by the manager of the ground handling agency. The flights were planned at an altitude of 10,000 feet, and the estimated elapsed time was about 30 minutes with total fuel endurance of four hours, and it would be conducted under instrument flight rules. So that means, so there's two different ways you can fly a plane, uh, VFR or IFR. Uh, visual flight rules or instrument flight rules. Mm-hmm. Uh, instrument flight rules is what you it's 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 what you think of with like flight plans and you know getting very specific instructions about where you can fly, and that's when you're flying purely by instrument. You don't have to necessarily see outside. You can fly into clouds. You can fly into bad weather uh, because you're using your instruments. Uh, visual flight rules is like you have to be able to see outside. And we've talked about visual yeah. approaches. You have to be able to see the ground. You have to be able to see where you're going and what's going on. Uh, you cannot fly into clouds. Cannot fly into bad weather. So this was an instrument flight rule um, flight, so they could fly just by instruments. Oof. On the flight were the two pilots, a one navigator, one test flight engineer, and 41 passengers. Uh, the passengers consisted of four uh, Sukhoi Civil Aircraft Company personnel, uh, one from the engine manufacturer, uh, and 36 invited passengers, uh, of which one was American, one was French, and 34 were Indonesian. Uh, and a representative, like I said earlier, a representative of a potential customer sat in the observer seat in the cockpit. Uh, he was a pilot and just an extra person in the uh-huh. cockpit who was just checking out the plane. 
The area for this demonstration flight was over what they called the Boger area. And while the pilot might assume the flight was approved to 20 miles away from the airport, like I said, the available charts on the aircraft did not contain information relating to the Boger area and the nearby terrain. Mm. Beyond about 25 miles from the airport, the minimum altitude that they should be able to fly at was 13,200 feet. And they were half of that. You said they were 6,000. Right. Uh, so, but that was at 25 miles. So as long as they stay within 20 miles, theoretically, they should be okay. But this is like going further away. This is where the mountain starts and this is where the terrain starts rising. Uh-huh. At about 2.26 Indonesia time, uh, which is 7.26 universal time. I'm going to be doing all universal time after this. Okay. So 7.26 universal time, 2.26 Indonesian time at seven hours. Uh, the pilot contacted Jakarta Approach and requested uh, a descent to 6,000 feet and subsequently requested to make a right orbit, and this was approved by the Jakarta Approach Controller. Like I said, they wanted to make this right turn, uh-huh. uh, to make it like one last turn, and then begin heading back to the airport. The Jakarta Approach Controller checked the flight data edit display, so his screen, uh, and found the information for the flight was listed as SU-30. Uh, this is So, you know, you think about like an air traffic controller, and they're looking at their screen, and they can see, you know, all the different planes, and it shows them uh, like a flight number, uh, the plane speed, the plane's altitude, and uh-huh. what kind of plane it is. And uh, like I said, uh, the the display for this controller said it was an SU-30. Wait, what, what does that mean? That's a good question, Chris. What <laughs> does that mean? So remember I said that Sukhoi mainly made military planes? Uh-huh. The SU-30 is a fighter jet. Oh. So remember, this was a new plane. The system didn't know what to show for it. So. It just said SU for Sukhoi and 30 because I believe, I, I, don't, I don't know why it said 30. I think, remember, I, the flight number was long, 36801. I think maybe it just pulled the three and the zero out of there. That's speculation on my part. I don't know. I don't know why it said SU-30. Uh-huh. The air traffic controller looks at that and thinks, oh, this is a fighter jet that's contacting me uh, that wants to descend. Oh. Weird, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not something you normally think about. And he didn't, or she didn't know that it was this like tour thing going on they 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 didn't know who they were talking with they were just like oh this fire air air traffic control talks to lots of people especially jakarta's you know jakarta's a big city there's lots of uh planes in the area they don't know who they're talking they just look at it okay fighter jet okay it seems i don't know it feels weird to me be like oh fighter jets hanging around like it but i I guess like yeah even here in austin at the austin airport if you ever watch the planes coming and going you see fighter jets land all the time oh okay in fact, Indonesia, the Indonesian military does operate some uh, SU-30 fighter jets in its air force. Okay. Or I should say they did at the time. Uh, I don't know if they still do, but at the time they did operate some. So, like I said, the controller sees this on, their, uh, on his display. And, you know, after checking this information, the controller's understanding of this aircraft type was that it was a military aircraft and that it was flying to this Boger area for a test flight because there's like a military training area in that Oh, in that area. So it's it was the military training area was a little further away than the the super jet intended to be initially, but it was relatively close. So, you know, in the controller's mind, I could see why they see what they think is a fighter jet. It's kind of close to a training area and they think, oh, they're going lower because they want to go over to that training area. Uh, this training area was called the Atang Sanjaya training area. And the training area was from the ground up to 6,000 feet. So in the controller's mind, they think, oh, they're descending to 6,000 feet because they're going to go to the training area. Oh, so that's why they didn't like warn them about the the plane graveyard. (laughs) Right. Because they assume, oh, it's a military plane. It's going to be training. And Military planes have super high performance and they're going to be aware of the mountain and they're going to avoid it. So you see, it's already the little things are starting to happen. So at 750 UTC, the Jakarta approach controller on duty noticed that the flight disappeared off from their radar monitor and there was no alert on the radar system prior to the disappearance of the target. Yeah, it just uh, blipped out of just, existence. Right. And they didn't notice at the time uh, because 18 minutes earlier at 732 universal time, the plane had impacted uh, a ridge on Mount Salak about 28 miles away from the airport uh, at approximately 6,000 feet. I bet it all happened in, what, like half a second? Yeah, it was, it was just instant. Um, that's, t- that's, t- uh, Gus, that's the most terrifying to me. 
Uh, I think about, I've actually thought about that a lot when I was uh, looking into this incident. Uh Like if you think about it, it's just, you know, people milling about, probably drinking champagne, hanging out, walking around in the plane, and then that's it. The plane impacts a cliffside. No warning at all. Uh, Yeah, it's like, right. It's I don't know, there's something scary about it. Like you always think about, you know, like in movies, right? Plane crashes and things like that. They're always like these like prolonged scenes like we've even talked about several of them right yeah it's like do, 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 it takes you know, a long like, time yeah but just it's so terrifying just that like nah, 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 and then go. I, 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 i'm glad to hear you think the same thing i was i was actually very <laughs> terrified <laughs> uh look, looking into this incident thinking about that the last recorded radio altimeter data said that the plane was at 370 feet because of course the mountain was right under it uh, and the plane impacted on an 85 degree slope ridge. I thought it was 80. It's 85 degrees, apparently. So almost oh. vertical slope. Obviously, yeah. all the occupants were uh, killed and the aircraft was destroyed. And how long was that warning? Like, okay, okay. how long is it between the first warning and impact? Do we know? Chris, that is the next sentence in the script here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a little creepy that you're asking that because it's literally the next thing I was about to read. So... 38 seconds before the impact, the terrain awareness warning system, audio warning, terrain ahead, pull up, activated once, and then avoid terrain activated six times. Oh my goodness. What were they doing? Actually, the pilot silenced the (gasps) system, assuming that it was a warning. Yeah. He assumed that the warning was a problem with the system, that the system wasn't working right. Do you know what he, I, I doubt, I don't think you would be able to guess, but do you know what he thought the problem was? Let me think, let me think. Did he think it was it, the 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 system was reading the plane wrong and thought it was further down than it was or something like that? I don't know. That's a good guess. What he thought was uh, this, the reason I asked you this, Chris, is that this is something we had talked about once before. He thought it was a problem with the the database in the system. Oh, oh, that makes sense. He thought that the database was outdated and that it was giving false alerts. He thought the database, yeah. And remember, because this was an IFR flight, they could fly in the clouds, and they were in the cloud. Oh, no. So they never saw the mountain. The system, the alert started going off, and they just hit it without ever seeing it. Oh, my God. That's even scarier. They were just in a cloud. And then, Mm -hmm. why did he assume that it was out of... That's a big assumption. Yeah, yeah. I I agree with you, Chris. That is a big assumption. (laughs) You would think, at the very least, you'd be like, hey, maybe we should climb, or maybe we should turn around. So I said that there were different alerts that activated. First, it said terrain ahead, pull up. And uh-huh. then and I said that, that activated once. And then it said avoid terrain. Uh, that activated six times. The difference between those alerts is the first one, like I said, is terrain ahead, pull up. That's telling them they're going to impact the ground. And if they pull up, they'll be able to avoid it. Uh-huh. Uh, once they reach a point where the system knows that they will not be able to Oh, pull up no. fast enough, that's when it says avoid terrain. That's supposed to let the pilots know they need to intervene and either make a left or a right turn in order to avoid terrain. Oh, so the, the command has different... It's not just saying, hey, you're, you're, the ground's getting close. Hey, it's closer. It's, it's, it has different meaning. Correct. The first one explicitly says pull up. Uh-huh. The second one just says avoid terrain because the system knows they cannot pull up fast enough. Oh, my goodness. So the, that there is, you know, the different... The different alerts are telling them different things. And in fact, seven seconds before the impact, they got a, they got a, a flight warning system audio uh, alerted them saying, landing gear not down. Oh, no. And that's to let them know <laughs> that, that that's another system that's telling, that assumes they're getting really close to the ground, so they must be wanting to land. Hey, the landing gear is not down. Oh, and they never did anything? They silenced it. Oh, my God. All of them? Uh, yeah. Oh, my God. So... so you know, this TAS system, like I said, is, is supposed to prevent controlled flight to terrain by giving the crew timely alerts based on predicted terrain obstacle clearance profiles calculated with real-time actual aircraft performance. So this is what you talked about earlier. This is the advanced kind that uh-huh. gives them predicted collisions and predicted performance. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking because it was like, it's fairly modern, right? I right. mean, it, it right. should have, yeah. And like I said a little while ago, if a pull-up maneuver is not sufficient for the aircraft to clear terrain directly along the flight path, the forward-looking software generates a unique avoid terrain warning to notify the flight crew that based on the operational status of the aircraft, an alternate course of action, left or right turn, may be necessary to avoid the controlled flight into terrain. Hmm. How evasive, I mean, this, this is a jet, right? So it's fairly small, right? So it's fairly like maneuverable, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty, pretty good performance. But, you know, as you get closer to the obstacle, 
it becomes more yeah. difficult. Like it's more in your field, like more yeah. in front of you, you know, it's getting bigger in front of you. I, oh, that's so frustrating, Gus. It, it really is. So the Jakarta approach radar system was equipped with labels on obstacles such as the tops of the mountains in the area. Uh, the terrain information surrounding Mount Salak had not been inserted into the system, and the minimum safe altitude warning was not operational, although the system had the capability. The oral warning on the radar was also deactivated, hence all the warnings associated with oral warning only provided a visual warning on the blinking label. That's why they didn't hear anything. You know, there are systems to alert controllers when planes are getting uh, too close to terrain and too close to mountains, but all of the audio alerts were disabled. It was just visual. It was just like something flashed and then blinked away. Wait, wait. You, because they disabled it, like the pilot disabled it? This, or? This, this is at air traffic control. Oh, oh. Remember, I said that they didn't notice for 18 minutes that the flight had disappeared. Oh, no. Uh, and that's why they didn't know that it was maneuvering over towards uh, Mount Salak because the audio alerts that normally let everyone know were disabled or deactivated. And why? Uh, I don't know. I, I, that wasn't in the report. I don't, I don't know. It just they were deactivated. Mm. Okay. Um, so, they, so one, the pilot was ignoring them, and then ground control didn't hear them correct they didn't notice the flashing uh alert on the display oh no the jakarta radar service had not established the minimum vectoring altitudes uh, and based on the replay of radar display it showed that during the flight the aircraft made an orbit over this area at an altitude of 6100 feet and the uh, audio alerts did not activate when the flight was in the proximity of mount salak so back in the plane the crew you know they saw they knew they were getting these alerts and these error messages and they cleared them and they did this by pressing an alert cancel button and this erases the messages from their display and turns off the flashing master warning sign and cancels the audio alerts that they were receiving so like i said they were getting their terrain alerts they just canceled it and which turned all of their alerts off hmm. so i thought this was interesting i want to do something a little different in this episode there's a, I have a breakdown of the sequence of events as they were written out in the report. I think okay. it, would be, it would be interesting to go through them. Uh, and again, this is all universal time at seven hours for Indonesia time. Okay. At 7.26 and 37 seconds, the altitude was set to 5,984 feet. And at the time, they were at 9,992 feet. So this is when they begin their descent down to 6,000. To do their right turn. Correct. Their airspeed was 220 knots. Uh, and they begin their descent from 10,000 to 6,000 feet. And the cockpit voice recorder records uh, uh, someone in the cockpit saying, we're going to land to the opposite runway. This indicated that they were going to land on runway 06 because in the earlier flight, they had landed on runway 24. So they're just landing on the same runway, just in the opposite direction. Okay. Uh, remember, like I said, they were trying to get rid of some altitude because they knew they were going to go back and land in a bit. Okay. At 7.27 and 55 seconds, there was a discussion between the pilot in command and one of the uh, employees from the aircraft manufacturer. And the employee asked about the intention of the descent. The pilot in command stated the intention of the descent was for preparation to land on runway 06. Otherwise, it would be too high for the approach. Uh, the pilot in command explained further that another method, if they were too high, was to make an orbit. Uh, the pilot intention to descend to 6,000 feet and subsequently make an orbit was to lose altitude. Uh, the aircraft position at the time was too high to make the approach, so the situation differed from the first demonstration flight that landed on runway 24. Remember, they had done this earlier. That's why things are a little different on this flight. That's why they're doing this orbit. They're landing in the opposite direction. Okay. And the decision to orbit might be due to the fact that the flight had reached the point as approved on the flight plan as assumed by the pilot. He thought he was still only... Remember I said they were on the 200 radial? He thought he was still uh -huh. on that 200 radial 20 miles from the airport. He didn't realize that they were further away than that. Mm. Right around the same time the, uh, that this was going on, the second in command, so the first officer said, dark cloud ahead. Oh, no. Uh, right. Uh, the aircraft heading was 203 degrees, and the second in command mentioned there was dark clouds ahead while the aircraft was heading towards the Mount Salak area. Oh, this indicated that... the area around the mountain was cloudy. Remember, like I said, there were bad... That's why it's, they call it the airplane graveyard. There's bad weather around it. And well, it was, there were a lot of clouds around it that day. Okay, so that, that was actual clouds and not just the mountain. Correct. Okay, okay. I thought it was like, oh, those, look at those dark clouds. And they were like seeing the mountain through the clouds. No, no. Okay. No, no. There, 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 there were clouds. This episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store, count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. 
We all know the holidays are just around the corner and HelloFresh makes this busy time of year easier than ever with chef-crafted recipes and pre-portioned ingredients delivered right to your door so you can spend less time meal planning and prepping. Plus, you save money on dinner with HelloFresh and put it toward your holiday shopping. HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% less expensive than takeout. Plus, on top of that, I mean, I think it's just fun. You get everything sent to you, you get instructions, you follow them, and you eat a delicious product all in roughly about 30 minutes. Uh, I don't know about you, but that's exactly the kind of thing I like when I'm done Long day at work, come home, boom, easy, fun little project, 30 minutes, and then at the end, chomp, you get to eat it all. So go to HelloFresh.com slash BlackBoxDown65 and use code BlackBoxDown65 for 65% off plus free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash BlackBoxDown65, code BlackBoxDown65, that's BlackBoxDown, the number six and the number five. Again, that's HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. You know, uh, fall's here, weather's getting a little cooler. It's nice to get out, spend a little more time outside than uh, I had been over the summer. Uh, Plus, you're just getting out and feeling that cool autumn breeze is great. Uh, And there's a great way to do that thanks to electric e-bikes. From discovering new places around town to really going the distance, there's so much out there to see and you can experience even more with electric e-bike. And right now for a limited time, you can save up to $250 on their Black Friday bundle with the purchase of any 3.0 light or premium electric e-bike only available now through November 25th. I think it's so great how quick and easy it is to just grab the bike, get on it, go ride to either like a a store that's nearby, a restaurant nearby, pick up food, pick up groceries, whatever small things I need to do, bring them back. Uh, It's super comfortable. Uh, in some cases, it's quicker than taking my car because I don't have to worry about parking. Just go right up to the door, lock my bike right by the door at the little bike rack. Most places have it right by the front door, uh, especially around here. Some of the more popular restaurants and places don't have to worry about circling forever, looking for a spot. Just go right up on your bike. Don't. It's super fast. The electric XP 3.0 is your powerful companion for new adventures. You can cover up to 45 miles on one charge, reach up to 28 miles an hour with the powerful 500 watt motor. New motor is quieter with increased torque for more power, less noise. Optimized gearing and added suspension create the smoothest ride ever, even at higher speeds. Redesigned brakes provide better heat dissipation. A stronger rear rack supports everything you need for day-to-day rides or longer trips. Uh, You can customize your ride with new accessories like the Elite Headlight, Yep Seat, or a passenger package that holds riders up to 150 pounds. So start your next adventure with Electric XP 3.0 today. Order now, save up to $250 for the special Black Friday bundle. Visit electricebikes.com to learn more. That's L-E-C-T-R-I-C ebikes.com. Use the internet without ExpressVPNs like walking your dog in public without securing them on a leash. Most of the time, probably okay. But what if one day your dog runs away or gets dog napped? It's better to be careful, especially when it's as simple as using ExpressVPN. Every time you connect to an unencrypted network in cafes, hotels, airports, etc., your online data is not secured. Any hacker on the same network can gain access to and steal your personal data. But ExpressVPN creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet, so they can't do that. It would take a hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years to get past ExpressVPN's encryption. ExpressVPN works on all your devices, phone, laptop, tablet, even on your smart TV. So easy to use. Just fire up the app, click one button to get protected. Can't stress enough about how simple it is to use and how it works on every device. Uh, It's just there. You don't have to worry about like, oh, you know, is it going to mess up with what I'm doing? Is it going to cause any uh, unforeseen problems? No, it's just you turn it on and you're protected. And like they say, Keep it on desktop, laptop, phone, tablet, everywhere. I use all of those. I don't use smart TV, but it works on smart TVs too. You can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free at expressvpn.com slash blackboxdown. That's expressvpn.com slash blackboxdown. Expressvpn.com slash blackboxdown. At 728 and 37 seconds, the pilot in command demonstrated the aircraft ability for holding using the flight management computer entry data. So at this point, he's talking, remember, there was the other pilot who was watching the demonstration in the cockpit. Uh The pilot's demonstrating some of the automation in the plane. Uh, That's what he's doing at this time. And he shouldn't be doing this right now, right? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah, it would be a good idea to not do that. A little after that, at 729 and 18 seconds, the second in command stated that sometimes the ground can be seen through the cloud. Uh, This statement indicated the area around the aircraft was partially cloudy. According to the flight data recorder data, the area of the orbit was over that uh, training area I talked about before, the Atang Sanjaya training area. Uh Uh-huh. At 7.30 and 44 seconds, the pilot command demonstrated the aircraft terrain uh, avoidance warning system, a feature of terrain. He was demonstrating the terrain avoidance? Yeah. 
he was showing, because uh, there's different modes on it, and uh-huh. he was showing, remember there was that other pilot, he was showing it off to that other pilot about uh, how, you know, it, it, it obviously gives you ground proximity warning systems, but this display can also show you uh, kind of a rough map of the terrain in front of you so you know what's going on. Um, and he was doing it, and he didn't see the mountain? Well, because yeah, let me read this next sentence and oh. I'll explain <laughs> The pilot in command stated that kind of information was not necessary at the moment. And the guest who was sitting in the cockpit, remember that other pilot said, uh-huh. yeah, it's flat because they're doing their orbit. At the time they're looking at it, the plane isn't facing the mountain. It's still making the turn over towards the mountain. Oh. So it's looking away from the mountain and everything's flat. So they like turned right into the mountain. Correct. Because at this point they were on a heading of 070. So they're kind of heading east, northeast. Uh, and the plane's making that right hand turn over in the direction of the mountain. The turn is what really did it, right? Right. And yeah, they because at that point they were facing out towards the Java Sea, so of course it was flattened at it in that direction. And so it's, it's speculated that the guest's statement at that time of yeah, it's flat could have affected the pilot in command's perception that the whole area surrounding the flight path was flat. Oh. Uh, you see, this is another yeah, one of those little yeah. things. It's like, oh, like when you, it, that's one of the frustrating things when we talk about these incidents. It's like, how did this happen? It seems so obvious. It's like, oh, this little thing compounded little thing, with this yeah. little thing. And they just here. turned, they just turned on, oh, they just turned on the, like the, this, oh, look at our new state of the art uh, terrain yeah. avoidance system. Ah, oh, we don't need that. It's flat. Yeah. Oh my God. At 7.31 and 42 seconds, the pilot in command asked the second in command to request a right turn for return and approach. Uh, the second in command did not respond. He didn't respond. Right. Five seconds pass, and uh, th- th- it's, it's the next thing here. So five seconds pass, and the second in command asks the pilot in command's intention to continue the orbit or return to the airport. Th- then, however, this question was not responded by the pilot in command, and the second in command has to repeat the question three times. Oh, he's not paying uh, attention. Neither of right. them are. Right. Uh, and then the pilot in command eventually replies that his intention is to return. So conceivably, I mean, if I'm speculating, the pilot in command's probably talking with that other pilot and distracted. And the second in command, you know, it might be looking a little more at the flight controls and looking uh-huh. outside because he's the one who said that they're able to see the ground every now and then earlier. At 731 and 43 seconds, the flight data recorder revealed the roll angle was decreasing. So there's, that means that they're starting to get to the heading that they want. And then 10 seconds later, the aircraft reached a heading of 174 degrees, which is almost almost straight south, just a little east. Five seconds after that, the second in command mentioned he would make the request to Jakarta approach controller after the orbit was complete. The pilot in command commanded the second in command to make the request immediately. The orbit was performed by selecting the heading selector on the main control panel, initially to 333 degrees, then 33 then 103, then 150, then 174. There's like a little dial. I don't know if you've ever seen it in movies. Pilots will reach up and move like a little dial uh, kind of in the middle of the controls. Uh, uh-huh. When it's on autopilot, like that is just setting the heading for the autopilot. So if you want the plane to do a loop or like a circle, you can't just tell it to circle. You, give, you keep like changing the degrees as you're going. Like 90 degrees this way, then keep going, keep going, keep going. That way it's just constantly chasing the, the input you're giving it. Okay. Does that, is that clear? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Imagine you're in a big parking lot and your car's driving north. And if you had like an autopilot and you wanted to tell the car to, you know, do a, a circle, you wouldn't, you couldn't tell it go north because it's already going north. You would tell it, hey, go east. And then as it starts going east and getting close, like, hey, go south. Okay, yeah. Then, hey, go west. Hey, go north. Like, you, you just kind of like are constantly adjusting it. And then eventually you go all the way back around. You wouldn't say... Go south immediately because then it would just like turn too sharp, right? So you're just right, slow. and you you don't know what direction it would go in. Okay. It might go left, it might go right. It's like you you just kind of like tease it, kind of yeah. you know constantly make sure it's chasing your heading. So remember, I said it would uh, it was reducing its roll angle a little uh, before this, and the aircraft stopped uh, its turn and was flying on a heading as uh, of one seven four as selected on the heading selector. Uh, and at this point, the aircraft's not orbiting anymore. The orbit was initiated while the aircraft was on a heading of 200 and stopped on a heading of 174 instead of returning to a heading of 200. So they had not completed a full 360 degree orbit because they, I guess, the pilot command stopped giving it more inputs. Maybe, presumably because he's distracted talking to the other pilot who's in the cockpit. So, so they don't finish their maneuver? Right, they don't do the full 360. They stop short of it. So he's going too far, even further than he should. 
Well, he didn't go far enough. He didn't return to the north uh, the way he should have. Yeah, I guess I was thinking like he's going too far. I guess that would be west. Yeah, too far south and west away from the airport. Yes, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah you are correct. Because I, I guess at 7.30 and 14 seconds uh, and subsequently the pilot in command's attention was distracted with conversation not related to the flight. Uh, and the pilots may not have noticed the aircraft had exited the orbit and assumed it was still continuing to turn. Because again, remember, they're in a cloud, yeah. so they can't necessarily see if they're turning or not. No one's paying attention to the, to the controls and what's going on. And then at 7.31 and 58 seconds, the second in command mentioned he would make the request to Jakarta approach uh, after the orbit was complete. Remember, I just mentioned that. However, the aircraft had already stopped turning five seconds before that. Uh, and they just hadn't realized it. They just hadn't realized it. Oh, my God. Uh, the pilot in command action of turning the heading selector indicated the pilot in command was familiar with the autopilot basic mode. This skill is stored in a motoric program. It can be executed without requiring the central decision process. Uh, the typical skill-based error may occur during any distraction or degradation of situational awareness. This type of error can be characterized as either a slip or a lapse. So what they're saying is this is very basic. Fun. It's like fly autopilot 101. And this is a very fundamental error that has been made here by not monitoring this and not continuing uh giving uh inputs into the heading selector so they're really messed up like the yes. pi- they they are just not paying attention and they're yeah okay so at 732 and 13 seconds there was a discussion between the pilots to determine the heading to return to the airport uh it took several seconds for the second in command to determine the direction and return to the airport uh the investigation could not determine the reason for this uh, the second in command exclamations of determining the direction to return to the airport may have distracted the pilot in command. Again, that's I I, I don't know that, that that just lets me know that they really weren't paying attention. They didn't know where they were in relation to the airport and how to get back to the uh. airport. They have to look like oh where yeah where are we exactly? Where is the airport in relation to here? At seven thirty two and twenty nine seconds, the pilot in command commanded the second in command to request a right turn to a heading of zero two zero, so pretty much north, uh, and descend to sixteen hundred feet. Uh, the intention to descend to 1,600 feet was to descend to the turning altitude for the approach to runway 06 at the airport. Uh, at this time, the aircraft was flying on a heading of 174 and had been for approximately four miles. Uh, the pilot in command's intention to descend indicated he was not aware of the mountainous terrain surrounding the flight path. 15 seconds later, the flight data recorder recorded that heading selector has changed to 325 and the aircraft commenced a right turn with a roll angle of 20 degrees. Is that them realizing they didn't turn all the way? Yeah, well, at this point, I don't know if they ever really fully grasped that. This is because the pilot in command requested that they turn to a heading of 020. I don't know if that's because they realized that they hadn't turned or if now they're like, now they're looking at it like, okay, now we need to turn to go to the airport. Oh, okay. Four seconds after they started this roll to the right, that's when the warning started, the terrain ahead, pull up. So at this point, yeah, now, now they're turning straight into the mountain. Then over the next six seconds it's to gave that avoid terrain warning six times and then when it starts going off the second in command asks what is that oh no yeah the warnings from the taws activated as that aircraft started to roll to the right and once it started initiating this turn that forward looking function uh you know starts to extrapolate where the plane's going to go yeah. and it sees it knows like oh there's ter- there's terrain here and uh uh so it knows that Something's going to happen. And that's why it starts giving these, these errors. Uh, and the, it, it knows that the predicted flight path will collide with the terrain contained within the internal database within 120 seconds. And that's why it, at first it tells them terrain ahead, pull up. Because they have that means that within 120 seconds they will impact terrain unless they immediately climb. Then they don't immediately climb. That's when the warning changes to avoid terrain. Oh. That warning means the predicted flight path will collide with terrain within 120 seconds and pull up is not sufficient. They need to also turn left or right as well in order to avoid a collision. How tall is this mountain? It's tall. I, uh, I said it earlier. I want to say it was like 13,000 feet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was pretty tall. Uh, and, and they how were wide at this point, it? they were at 6,000 descending down wide. That's a good question, Chris. I don't know. It's a mountain. It's pretty wide. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> well, I'm wide. I'm just thinking like, you know, they're turning. It's like, there's a version where they're right on the edge and they just turn a little, you know, to the right, keep going, keep going uh, more west, right? To, yeah. And then, you know, if, I would think that if it were me, uh-huh. and again, I'm not a commercial pilot, I don't fly this plane, I would think, hey, we're turning right and it's telling us we're going to collide. Let's turn left. You know, mm. that would, that yeah. would be my thought pro- That would be my thought process. It wasn't telling us this, this when we were turned to the left. Let's go back in that direction. 
Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I guess they could have probably also executed a steeper bank to the right as well. That may have also worked. I guess, yeah, yeah. I guess it kind of depends on where they were in relation to it. Yes. It, and how fast they were going. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, because I, I don't know if you ever think about this. The faster you're going, the more distance your turn takes. Yeah, that makes sense. The same thing happens in a car. Like when you're going real slow, you can turn super tight. But if you're going like 60 miles an hour, you're covering more ground more quickly. So your turn is a lot wider. Yeah. Now imagine in a plane where you're going way faster than yeah. that. How fast are they going? I don't know at this particular point. When they started their descent, they were at 220 knots. So that's still pretty fast. Off the top of my head, I want to say it's like 250 miles an hour. Yeah, because they'd be picking up speed probably because they were descending, maybe? Right. Uh, possibly. Uh, okay. So yeah, 220 knots is 253 miles an hour or 407 kilometers an hour. So probably pretty fast. So during simulator exercises, at the time that the activation of the toss warning avoid terrain showed up, the navigation displays in front of both pilots switched to the terrain mode and a solid red cell with the black cross hatches were displayed between the headings of 190 and 230 at a distance of one up to three miles. So it's showing them Hey, between a heading of 190 and 230, there's something. (laughs) Yeah. The displays on the upper right corners accompanied by T-E-R-R ahead, terrain ahead, message flashing in red. And it's in the middle of when these warnings activate that the second in command asks, what is that? Oh. And this indicates a second in command was surprised with the warning and did not expect the warning would activate. And this shows that the second in command was not aware of the mountainous area surrounding the flight path. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess neither of them were. Right. So at 7.32 and 58 seconds, the flight data recorder records that this is when the terrain avoidance warning system was inhibited. That's when they silence it. Uh, And then as that happens, one second later, the pilot command says, maybe database. Uh, Maybe? Yeah. The flight data recorder uh, data revealed that the sys and terrain buttons of the toss were switched off. And this shows that the pilot command inhibited the warning system altogether. Oh, my God. This is so frustrating. Yeah, the pilot in command inhibited the system, like I said, thinking that maybe the terrain database was out of date, which we've heard before, but mountains don't change that much. I think it's what we said last time. Like a mountain's still a mountain, regardless of whether or not your database is out of date. This area, lots of mountains. Right. Like you said, they should know that, right? Yeah. But again, they don't fly here typically. They're here on a goodwill tour, so they may not have known. The, the, The pilot that was like, you don't need that here. It's flat. Is that a more local pilot? Yeah, he was. Uh, fl- he did fly for an Indonesian airline, but at the mm. time, he at the time they were facing out towards the Java Sea. Yeah, you know, yeah. Th- he assumed that they were flying north back up to the airport, not south mm. down to the mountains. Then, when the pilot commands, you know, said that it might be the database, he did not react appropriately to the warnings. This indicated he did not appreciate the significance of the warnings. Uh, and the simulator test showed that after the warnings were inhibited, the display of dangerous terrain, like I said, the solid red cell with black cross hatches, disappeared from the displays. And also the oral and visual alerts were off. So, like, he basically disables every single, like, flashing light and warning and siren that's going off. Oh, my God. Why? Uh. Yeah. So, for 20 seconds after the pilot command statement relating to the database, until the activation of the oral aircraft warning system, there was no conversation between the pilots. Meanwhile, the pilot command's command to request return to Hallam had not yet been executed. Uh, There was no further discussion related to the progress of the flight. This may have occurred due to excessive task demands or information within a short period. So remember, right before all this happened, he had told the second in command to request the return immediately to the airport. That still hadn't happened. And then everyone just got silence, silent for the next 20 seconds. Was it like they were processing? Why is that warning going off? They were, yeah, they were probably overloaded and probably thinking like, huh, what is going on? Why did that happen? And then maybe at this point now, they're starting to look around and be like, where are we? What is, what, what are we doing? You like, know, that's yeah, when so they're it kind of snaps them back. Yeah, right. Because that, that's what it sounds like. It sounds like they're just like, huh, probably, probably outdated database. And they turn it off and they're like thinking, huh. Does that make, and then. Right. Oh, and then, and then they, it's just, they blip. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then, well, there was one other warning, don't forget. Uh, At 7.33 and 19 seconds, they received, yeah, gear not down. Uh, And the flight data recorder revealed a pulse on side stick uh, movement to a pitch of five degrees up with a duration of two seconds. So they get the gear not down warning and they pitch up five degrees, which is kind of nothing for two seconds. So they start reacting. 
Right. Finally, finally, they're doing something. It's way too insufficient, but they're doing something. And, yeah. Then four seconds after that, uh, the second in command asks, what is that? And the pilot in command uh, says, autopilot off. So they saw the mountain. Conceivably. And this warning of gear not down was not from the aircraft warning system that had been disabled. This, Like I said earlier, this warning activates whenever the aircraft height was below 800 feet above the ground and landing gear is not down. Okay, or maybe they were. He was maybe it was him just reacting to the landing gear warning. The yeah, the gear alert because they be. were still in the clouds, so they couldn't. S- Correct. They never saw the mountain. I don't probably. believe so. I don't believe so. And at that point, the, it was the pilot in command who manually activated the side stick to five degrees pitch up, uh, and this is when the autopilot disengaged. The action of the uh, pilot in command to manually fly by operating the side stick to pitch up at five degrees uh, could not be an indication of an attempted escape action. Uh, mm-hmm. So. Conceivably, he probably didn't see it because that this was insufficient. Normally, yeah. an escape action requires flight control pull up, advance engine power to go around, and speed brake retract. Um, so they speculate he didn't see the mountain. He wasn't trying to evade it because then he would have given full power as well. Mm. So the investigation actually could not determine the reason the pilot did this. Sounds like just, well, I'm just going to, like, um, seeing all these things, I'm just going to pull up slightly, you know, like right. not knowing what else to do, just kind of like, did it. Right. Like, eh, why not? The simulator test showed that a successful recovery action had to be initiated within 24 seconds after the first TAWS warning. After this time, any pilot action would not successfully avoid collision with terrain. So it's not a lot of time, but it's still enough. 24 seconds is more than enough to pull up or turn. We've talked about cases that are like, oh, you have six seconds or you have 10 seconds right. of, of, of time, which is like, well, that's real quick. But they had, tw- that's 20 is a, it, it, it's a it, decent it, amount of time. It's to, enough to react. time to do something very simple, like up to Turn. left, right, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's that's a long time when you think about it. Because that's th- an eternity. Th- they had so many like opportunities. It seems like, mm-hmm. and, and, and I and I know that's real fast, but like the fact that it was like warning, 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 warning. Uh, yeah. I just ignore it. Yeah. Oh, it's and just then they, and then they just sit there for twenty seconds. Right. It's in silence. The subsequent investigation concluded the flight crew was unaware of the presence of high ground in the area and ignored warnings from the terrain warning system, incorrectly attributing them to a system malfunction while their view was obstructed because of thick cloud cover. It was established that in the minutes leading to the accident, the crew, including the captain, were engaged in conversation with prospective customers present in the cockpit. The crash is both the first hull loss and the first fatal accident involving a Sukhoi Superjet 100. And I didn't want to say too much about this earlier, uh, but... Another thing was, remember, the air traffic controller thought it was a military jet going to the training area. The air traffic controller also thought, you know, a high-performance military jet, if it gets close to the mountain, can go practically vertical, you know? Yeah, yeah, Uh, yeah. yeah. It's like a real high-performance sports car. It can do what it needs to do to get around it. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking about Top Gun stuff. (laughs) Right, right, exactly. (laughs) Like crazy things. So, got uh, some findings here I wanted to get through. The flight was planned under IFR, not on a published airway. Normally on IFR flights, they, they fly along airways, like we've talked about before. Mm-hmm. Like, like what you can think of them like highways in the sky. But since this wasn't a flight between point A and point B, it was just like a demonstration flight, it was IFR, but not really on an airway. Uh, normally airways exist because they safe. guarantee yeah. safety, right? They guarantee safety and they tell you minimum altitudes to fly at and uh, where you can be. Uh, the aircraft was airworthy prior to fly. No evidence the aircraft had any system malfunction during the flight. I know you speculate, you, you wondered about that a little bit earlier mm-hmm. uh, when the first plane uh, had problems, but this plane was totally fine. Mm-hmm. The database was up to date. Um, the flight crew had valid flight license and medical certificates. There was no evidence of crew incapacitation. Pathological examination did not find any alcohol or drug influencing the pilots. Uh, the duty and rest periods for the crew within 48 hours before the flight were within limits. Air traffic control assumed the flight would be performed at Boger area, while the pilots assumed the flight was approved on the 200 radial to 20 miles away. Uh, The evidence showed that the first and second demonstration flights reached that point. The chart available on board the aircraft did not contain information of the Atang Sanjaya training area and only limited information of the surrounding mountainous area. Uh, The pilot in command acted as pilot flying. The Jakarta flight data officer entered the data of the flight into the flight data edit display as Sukhoi 30, since the database uh, did not contain Sukhoi RRJ 95B. Remember, like we said, mm-hmm. it, it, I, I don't know why they chose 30, but they chose 30, which is a fighter jet. 
The flight data edit display showed the flight was a Sukhoi 30, which was a military aircraft, resulting in the controller believing the flight was a Sukhoi military aircraft. The crew requested descent to 6,000 feet, and the orbit was approved by air traffic control, despite the fact the minimum sector altitude was 6,900 feet. So they just the controller cleared them lower than what was safe, but... Thought they were a fighter jet doing training. Doing training, going to the training area that exists between the ground and 6,000 feet. Yeah. The recorded radar data indicated the aircraft orbited over the Atang Sanjaya training area. Uh huh. The pilot demonstrated that the aircraft feature of terrain display while turning and heading northeast and stated it was not required at the time. The potential customer who was sitting in the cockpit replied, yeah, it's flat. But as we talked about, they were turning, they were looking at the sea at the time. There were prolonged discussions between the pilots and potential customer relating to aircraft fuel consumption, which may have distracted the pilots and delayed flight crew determining the direction to return to the airport and the aircraft unintentionally exited the orbit. So just a distraction. Yeah. I will say, you know, when I've been taking my flight training, my pilot lessons, uh-huh. that's one of the things the instructor does all the time. He will try to talk to me, <laughs> try to distract me as I'm doing things. Like, so it's like on purpose to train you. Right. To train me when to tell people to shut up. <laughs> Ah, uh, what do you and what do you say? <laughs> you you normally say like uh stand by or like uh, hold on a minute, just like yeah yeah. You, I'm I'm curious like because it, it's it's that's the weird thing. It's like your instructor, it, you know, as a authority over you. But if you're like hey, be, like I need you to be quiet. <laughs> but that's good. That's good because that's he's expecting that because you know when eventually you do get your own license and if you do have a passenger who's chatty, you need to be able to tell them, even though they're probably your friend or whatever. Yeah. You go tell them like, Hey, not right now. I need you to be quiet. No, that's really good that they're, that, yeah. Do they tell you, did they tell you that they were doing that consciously? He eventually told me that after, after some time. And I was like, <laughs> okay. I was like, I felt like I was going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the Jakarta approach controller's attention focused on controlling other aircraft with intensive communication exchange without pause. Remember, uh, you asked why he wasn't aware, why the controller wasn't aware this was a demonstration flight. The controller was very busy, had mm-hmm. like no pause in their work. There was one oral warning of terrain pull up and six of avoid terrain and visual warnings. The pilot command inhibited the TAS system function, assuming there was a problem with the database. The simulation test concluded the TAS was functioning properly and the impact could have been avoided by appropriate reaction of the pilot up to 24 seconds after the first TAS warning. So it's not a lot of time, but it's still enough. 24 seconds is more than enough to pull up or turn. The flight warning system of landing gear not down provided additional information that the aircraft was in proximity to terrain. So like this is a second system that's also letting them know that they're close to the close to terrain. The Jakarta radar service had not established a minimum vectoring altitude for certain areas. The terrain information surrounding Mount Salak had not been inserted into the Jakarta radar system, hence the minimum safe altitude warning uh, system did not provide any warning to the controller. I think, if, like what I said earlier, they had information about the tops of the mountains, but not necessarily like the sides as well. So it was the system had some gaps in it. Okay. The oral warning of the Jakarta radar system had been deactivated. This is the one in the air traffic control tower. Uh, the aircraft impacted into an 85 degree slope ridge terrain on the 198 radial from the airport at approximately 6,000 feet. The Jakarta approach controller noticed that the aircraft had disappeared from the radar screen 24 minutes after the impact. So it took them a long time to realize the plane was missing. Did they realize, like, because people on the demonstration side were like, hey, what happened? Did they contact them? Be like, I think what happened, if I remember right, is the controller realized that the plane hadn't landed. Like, since it's an IFR flight, they have a flight plan. They're expected back. I think the controller looks and realizes, like, hey, that plane didn't land. I thought they were like, oh, they just assumed it was going to land at like the the, uh, the training base or something. Mm-mm. Uh, so well, they were looking for they they were they were looking for them. So, yeah. So when looking at the screen, they assume it was a military plane going to the training area. But, you know, when looking at planes that are landing and that have landed, they realize, hey, there's an open flight plan here for a plane that hasn't come back yet. Mm. And they're like, oh, it was that one that's that was over there. Um, and the controller realized that it was a Sukhoi 100 only after he called the tower controller. Um, uh, okay, now it's unimportant. So it's uh, so yeah. I mean, the approach controller didn't even know until he had to, he had to call someone else. He's like, oh, it wasn't a military plane. Oh, it, and that's when they realize. That's when they start connecting everything. And what what was going on at the like? I guess the back at the airport where they were doing the demonstration were there people there waiting for them or were most of the people on the plane that were part of the demonstration that's actually a little 
morbid. <laughs> um, uh, I don't want to get into that too much. Oh, okay. But yeah, um, reports are that, you know, when the plane didn't come back and was missing, that people who were waiting started trying to call the cell phones of the people on the plane. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, and that some of them started ringing uh, and that no one answered. That yeah, is- it's like, it's 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 pretty morbid. Like, I, I normally try to avoid getting, like, too yeah. deep into, like, that side of things uh, on the part. That's, that's about as much as I'll say about yeah. it. But, yeah, there were people waiting. And, that, and that's when everything starts kind of, people start wondering, where is it? What's going and, on? And they didn't find the plane until at night? Or the next it was day? the next day, yeah. Uh, because remember, they could they they didn't know exactly where it was, and it had crashed into the side of a mountain, and it was cloudy. And they couldn't necessarily see it. And you said it was like seven p.m. their time, so it was getting late. Uh, no, it was seven a.m. Universal oh. time, so it was the afternoon, which is like okay, what like two to three p.m. Uh, Jakarta time. Okay, so they okay. I was in my head. It was like evening. No, so they did. So it was. You know, mid afternoon, late afternoon, I'd say, and uh, you know, it's, the day's ending. It's only a couple more hours of daylight by that point, and then there was bad uh, weather around the mountain as well, and so they have to start looking. Uh, but yeah, that's it. I mean, that's uh, yeah. the I, I I don't know what to call this one. Normally, we give them flight numbers. It's like I said, this one's a flight. The the flight number was a mouthful. Well, and also it correct sort of. <laughs> yeah, that was all, that was also part of the whole uh, response. Not shockingly, this plane was never really a success. They really yeah. didn't have any more sales. I don't know really of any operator for it outside of Russia. Uh, I mean, I think this, it's, it's all Russian airlines that use it. I mean, you can't have a worse launch of a, of a product than this. It's pretty bad. Well, we talked about, remember the A320, yeah. they were demonstrating it and it crashed into trees at a yeah, at yeah. the air show. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I was thinking, there was that one other air show one. That was, that was a crazy one. That was like what, yeah. around episode like 50 somewhere around there it's hard to get an exact number uh i believe there's still right around 170 that have been delivered they really didn't take off anymore uh, yeah all of the operators of the sequoia superjet are uh are pretty much russian i think i see uh one here that's used by kazakhstan and three by the royal thai air force other than that it's all russian operators uh who use this plane okay uh, so yeah, the the jet the jet failed to uh, really attract any any further commercial attention. It's yeah. pretty much w- would be relegated as like a failure because you know these are so expe- yeah. planes are so expensive to develop and launch that you need to sell a lot of them before you start to make money on all of the development cost. Yeah, uh, but that's it uh, for this the Sukhoi Superjet uh, one hundred. Uh, again, another one of those really frustrating ones where it's like so many little things and distractions that yeah. um, that lead to this awful tragedy. But we'll be back next week with uh, another episode. Yeah. And uh, thank you for anyone who is supporting us uh, via uh, First Membership or um, Black Box Down Premium or First Class or however you, <laughs> however you want to call it. Yeah, I think we unofficially call it that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much. And uh, we'll be talking to you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.